Yeah, it's recording. Okay, all right. We'll get the national and the regimental in the background. Yeah, it looks right. good. Beautiful. All right. Okay, welcome. I'm Max Kenny with the Sorry. Okay, my name is Max Kenny, and I'm a sergeant with Company K, 67th New York, for selling on volunteers. And today, uh, which is May 15th, 2017, we were actually at the first school program, first civil war program, to be held at Old Bethpage Field Restoration, in Old Bethpage in Long Island. So for this year, uh, we've managed to pull out about 17 soldiers, and we have about 2,000 kids. And this has all been organized by Commander Frank Bradford of the 10th New York Cavalry. And uh, they were down the road along with uh, General Ulysses S. Grant. We have the 3rd Virginia, I believe the British Observer. Oh well, okay, so another, uh, another round of enemy is coming in, so we're going to have to hold our, uh, our recording for now. It's a really cool place to see. If you, that's the blacksmith shop. Okay? If you go down this road and you bear to the right, there's an active farm. Beautiful place. Farm house, barn, and everything. Power farm. Okay? Water that time? No water? Okay. Shoulder, arms, two ranks, right face. Thank you. 
right now, and what we're all holding is a musket. And these muskets are about 10 pounds. We've got two basic types. We have an Enfield musket, which is manufactured in Great Britain. We want to have a Springfield musket, which is manufactured in Springfield Armory, which still exists right now in Massachusetts. However, they both operate with the same common principles. It's a muzzle loading weapon. The muzzle is up here. <laughs> Muskets are heavy. Alright, the are at the corner. You're standing shoulder to shoulder, touching. Firing requires nine different steps. Medic! See how long that took. It takes about 
demonstrate company style tactics. These were tactics used to maximize the amount of lead going down the field. There were also skirmish tactics, which meant they became an open order. The job of the skirmishers would be getting the other side to show where they were. It was important for them to keep their alignment and move forward. The flag was always at the center. It was not only the place of honor, and the men around it were to give their lives to preserve the flag, it served as a signal. As you will see, a tremendous amount of smoke comes out of these weapons, and it's extremely difficult to see, and in the noise of battle, it's even harder to hear. So they would have drummers drumming various drum calls, Buglers calling, and then the officer himself would be shouting orders. In a matter of minutes, I can guarantee you, the officer would lose his voice, and they would be down to whispering to the bugle. They're now at rest. The small flag with the 67 on it, on it was the guide on it. It would, not, it would be held on either side of the regiment, and that particular guide on would mark the extent of the regiment. One thing most people who get confused by Hollywood do not realize is that only the colonel was in the front, and he was by the flag because the flag bearers and the flag company did not fire. He himself was there, but every other officer and the sergeants, once they lined on the line, were in the rear. Their job was to close the file by moving people forward. Again, while these men are quite practiced in Civil War tactics, you will notice that they are not snapping like the sea soldiers today. They were much slower movements. They are carrying approximately the same equipment or the same amount and weight of equipment that soldiers carry in the battle, but it's carried differently. Many of the uh, enlisted personnel, you can tell if they've been in, they were stoop sold shoulder after the war due to the weight on their shoulders of all that ammunition. The officers frequently had uh, difficulties with hernias and ripped muscles because all their equipment was carried on a belt. This was quite heavy. The rifle itself is, with all of its equipment and everything else, somewhere around 12 pounds. And the bayonet gets off balance. So it, it was not as easy as it looks. It would also be carrying a canteen of water, not the nice deal they have today. These are tin canteens. Uh, they would go through that water quite quickly because one of the problems with black powder, as you call it, gunpowder, is that it is got a salt in it, and the more you fire, the thirstier you get because you're breathing in salt. So they would go through their canteens quite rapidly, which would, of course, create problems. They were required, by the way, to fire three rounds a minute to sustain the fire down the line. 
this is fine, except for one thing. In the July heat in Gettysburg, could you imagine trying to fire three rounds, or even some got to four rounds a minute, in the heat, in the smoke, running out of water, usually by the time they finished the ammunition in their ammo pouch, they were exhausted. They also carried extra ammunition. At 40 rounds in that, car, uh, that leather pouch, they also were ordered frequently to carry 60 in their pockets, which meant that they had 100 rounds frequently going into battle. It wouldn't take them long to be totally and completely exhausted. And they've opened fire. The Confederates are in open order. Skirmish line. By the way, one other thing you might know, horses do not like noises, so all of those wonderful uh, Hollywood films you see with the charging across the field isn't necessarily so. As they load, they go through the entire loading procedure. They fire a volley. Now they're spreading out to try to fight this small group of Confederates. While you might not think this is real according to Hollywood, this is pretty much what most of the battles are like. Small groups. The one unit has been given a fire at will. The other unit is still throwing mass lead down. One of the issues we fought to face is that these weapons were deadly at 450 yards, the same as a World War II weapon. Uh, the only difference is it's a high trajectory. So you can aim at them and it would go over their heads in some cases, but if you got close in or far away, you were in the killing zone. The other item is, remember that these are not trained sharpshooters. Most of the men just had a few minutes practice before they went on the field. The Army didn't want to waste ammunition, so you might find that there were a lot of misses. But that bullet could go through more than one man. Again, mass fire on, the, on my right. Ah, uh, you just saw one man, one of the problems. They use a percussion cap, which is fulminate of mercury, to fire the gunpowder. It didn't always go off. That was a problem. There was one case at Gettysburg where a young man got so nervous, and believe me, they got very nervous in these lines, that he loaded 13 rounds in his weapon before it finally went off. He never heard that it didn't go off. They found it that way. Other weapons blew up with the amount of strand cartridges that they would have. Again, because it was a very nervous time in the heat and all that. Now the Confederates are pulling back. The color bearers would actually sit there and wave the flags back and forth for two reasons. One of which is to taunt the enemy. The second reason is to make sure that everybody could see where they were. In the smoke, all you would see was something moving. And if this was a very humid hot, uh, and hot day, that smoke would be hanging down, and within a matter of five or six minutes, they would be walking around in a, a white cloud. Now with casualties, later in the war they had a, a very efficient medical system. The medical system is the basis of what is used today in the ambulance forces, the Nassau County Police Ambulances, their fire department ambulances use the exact same system as they used later on in the war, developed by Jonathan Letterman. Before that, very frequently men could lie on the battlefield for days and never be picked up. Get back to life. <laughs> 
They are now reforming the company. Welcome to Hope. Oh, Sorry, I found that my phone. Ready! Out! Additional troops are coming on the field. This patrol is bitten off far more than they could chew, literally. The 119th has provided a sergeant start. You will uh, supplement the company from the 67. The Confederates are gaining a lot of valuable information, even though it's just like they're drinking away each other. What they're learning is that there's a lot more troops than they thought there were in the area. Their major job is now to try to get away without being overrun to get that information back. One of the reasons for many of these small actions is something that we don't realize with a well-equipped army of today. Many of these men were on marching rations, which consisted of hardtack, which is a cracker that defies the human ability to chew it unless you soak it, which was the bread they used. So what many of the units did this might not have been a legitimate group of Confederates out trying to find out who's where. They might have been looking for chickens, and the Union might have been doing the same thing. Because unless they became a Confederate officer once said, it was far better to use the two pistols in his belt than he refused to carry a saber at all. <coughs> The horses are very well trained, and so were some of the horses back then. Again, when you're putting horses through remount station a thousand at a time, you never really knew what you got. These horses are specially trained for this, uh, as they would be police horses. Even then, they're still skittish at times when there's noise. is going to stay by and watch the cavalry go through their evolutions.